let's do homework together. Let's jump into Defeating Darwinism and read through this book together. It can be a lot to swallow. While it says it is written for a high school level, you are only in eighth grade. And I would say it's probably written for more of a collegiate level, um, the way school is run these days rather than 30 or 40 years ago. So we're gonna jump into the introduction today. First thing I wanna say is one, be sure to have your highlighters with you so you can highlight using the um, method in your guide. Um, that's in the exposition appendix. It talks about the five highlighting colors. And then, so familiar, familiarize yourself with that and you can highlight as you go through. I will point out a couple of things that I've highlighted, but not everything. The second thing I want to say is in the introduction, the whole point of this chapter is to answer one question. That one question is, why did Mr. Johnson write this book? Okay, he's going to divide his explanation into two parts and he's going to talk about two conversations that inspired him to write this book. So let's jump in and read together. And if we haven't met before, hi, I'm Erica Lynn and I help homeschooling become easy for you too. Okay, starting in the introduction, this brook grew out of two conversations. The first one, now I highlighted that in green. Green is for organizational points. Since this chapter is organized into two sections, I highlighted the first one, as in the first conversation, so I knew this is starting the first section. The first was in spring 1996 with friends from InterVarsity Press, my usual publisher. The press was ready for me to do another book, but I wasn't sure I was ready. I had already done a book, Reason in the Balance, a year earlier. I had just come back from a long lecture tour and I was immersed again in law school work. Remember, Mr. Johnson is an attorney, not a scientist. And I had a lot of magazine writing to do. I wanted to take my time before beginning another project as demanding as a book. As we talked, however, it became clear that there was one book I needed to write very soon. I had taken on the scientific evidence for Darwin evolution in the book he wrote, Darwin on Trial, 1991. And I had gone into the philosophical, moral, and educational consequences of Darwinism in Reason in the Balance in 1995. Both books were successful and helped to open up a renewed public debate about whether Darwinism is really true. Both went into considerable detail about scientific and intellectual subjects. However, a lot of readers who needed to know the basic message found them heavy going, meaning they just could not understand the language. It was written on too um, academic of a level for most readers. There was clearly a need for a short book aimed at a different audience, one not quite so familiar with university level subjects. In particular, I wanted to write for late teens, high school juniors and seniors and beginning college graduates, along with the parents and teachers of such young people. These young people need to take advantage of the wonderful educational opportunities our society offers, but they also need to protect themselves against the indoctrination in naturalism that so often accompanies education. Textbooks and other educational materials today take evolutionary naturalism for granted and thus assume the wrong answer to the most important question we face. Now, they said this is the most important, so I highlighted this question in yellow as the main point. Is there a God who created us and cares about what we do? That is the question that Darwinism tries to answer in evolution, and that is the question that Mr. Johnson is going to answer in this book. Young people need to be prepared for the indoctrination, and for that, they need to know some things that the public schools aren't allowed to teach them. That's the main job of this book, and everybody I've talked to seems to agree that it's a job that needs to be done. All right, that ends the first section of this introduction. And essentially what he's told us there is that he has already written three books about evolution and Darwinism. And while those are great books, he sees there is a need to write a book 
to younger students who are in the public school system and getting ready to go to college so that they can get educated without becoming indoctrinated. So he sees the need to write a new book at a much lower academia level so that it's easy for the common person to read and understand. This brings me to the second conversation. Now that second conversation I highlighted green again, showing that we are starting a new section of this introduction which occurred in the faculty club of my own university. I remarked to one of my senior Berkeley colleagues that the scientific community was baffled at its failure to convince the general public to believe in evolution. Despite massive educational efforts, including a pitch for evolution on every public television program that deals with nature, the state of public opinion hadn't changed much in the last 30 years. Polls show that under 10% of the American public believes in the official scientific orthodoxy, which is that humans and other living things were created by a materialistic evolutionary process in which God played no part. The remaining 90% is more or less evenly divided between biblical creationists and theistic evolutionists who think evolution was God guided. Why won't the people believe what the evolutionary scientists tell them science has discovered? Let's pause right there. I want you to notice right now that this book, if we flip over here, was written in 1997, okay? That was over 25 years ago. Those numbers have changed. And if you Google it, it is much higher now. My colleague commented, it's just that the people don't understand the theory. Oh no, I blurted out an answer. The people understand the theory better than the scientists do. My colleague looked at me as if he were trying to decide whether I was joking or insane, and we let the matter drop. As I thought over what I had said, however, I realized how true it was. My experience speaking and debating on this topic at universities has taught me that scientists and professors in general are often confused about evolution. They may know a lot of details, but they don't understand the basics. The professors typically think that evolution from molecule to man is a single process that can be illustrated by dog breeding or finch beak variations. Both of those examples we'll learn more about later in the book. That fossil evidence confirms the Darwinian process of step-by-step -step change. That monkeys can type Hamlet if they are aided by a mechanism akin to natural selection. And that science isn't saying anything about religion when it says that we were created by a purposeless material process. All of those beliefs are egregiously false, as I will explain in the chapters to come. Many ordinary people are also confused about these subjects, of course, but they do tend to grasp one big truth that the professional intellectuals usually seem incapable of seeing. The people suspect that what is being presented to them as scientific fact consists largely of an ideology that goes far beyond the scientific evidence. That is why they are so resistant to it. If high schoolers need a good high school education in how to think about evolution, professors and senior scientists seem to need it just as badly. And that's what this book aims to get, a good high school education in how to think about evolution. It's for high schoolers, college students, parents, teachers, youth workers, pastors, and also scientists whose education didn't encourage them to take a skeptical look at the claims of Darwinian theory. There was much scientific detail in the book, or much advanced philosophy. I've covered the science and the philosophy in my earlier books and refer readers to the relevant chapters as appropriate. I'll also refer in the research notes to some helpful teaching materials that are available on the World Wide Web. As additional materials become available, they'll be announced at the Access Research Network website, which he gives there. I'm sure it won't be long before we will have a first-rate internet site available where teachers and parents can exchange insights about teaching techniques and materials. As this book's title indicates, understanding evolution is mainly a matter of opening minds, of freeing people to think about it as they would other important subjects. All it really takes is precise definitions and good thinking habits. The skills you'll develop in learning to understand evolution will come in handy for a lot of other things too. Actually, you'll find out that they are the same skills that scientists like Carl Sagan have advocated all along. 
It's just that we are going to apply those skills to evolution, a subject that has for too long been protected from critical thinking by law and academic custom. In the second part of that, in the second conversation, to summarize it shortly, basically he is saying that we need to apply logic or reasoning, um, such as your learning in introductory logic and intermediate logic, to this theory of evolution. If we apply logic to the theory of evolution, we find that the claims do not stand up according to a um, syllogism. If you follow through the syllogism, that most often the claims that the evolutionists are making don't stand up logically and they're not deducible by the information that is presented to us. So those are the two topics, two reasons why he wrote this book. One, to make it an easier read for lower academia people to read and understand what's going on. And two, to talk about the logic of the argument of evolution and to discredit it from a logical point of view. I hope this has been helpful and I hope you enjoy the rest of the book.